The last time we did a deep dive on ACES, the latest version was 1.2, and a lot has changed since then. For starters, version 1.3 has come out, and it's actually a much bigger deal than a simple point release. On top of this, ACES 2.0 is right around the corner, so whether you are starting from zero or brushing up, it's a good time to start paying more attention to ACES. Today, I want to show you two of the biggest changes that came about in ACES 1.3. So let's take a look here inside of Resolve and talk about ACES 1.3. Now we're gonna be kind of building on concepts and ideas that we talked about in my ACES Explained series, which as I mentioned, was on ACES 1.2. However, the core concepts and principles that we talk about in that series are going to hold. So if you wanna go even deeper on ACES than we're going to go today, I encourage you to check out that full three-part series. For today, we're gonna to do things a little bit differently than we did in that series where we were doing all of our color management in nodes using the ACES Transform OFX node. Today, we are gonna do our color management in our project settings. So let's take a look at what that looks like. I'm gonna to go to my file menu here and I'm gonna to go to my project settings and we're gonna go over here to our color management, okay? Now, what I, what I wanna do first thing is look at my color science and I'm gonna select ACES CCT, okay? And I'm gonna leave this on ACES 1.3, or if you weren't already on ACES 1.3, you would wanna to flip to that. And the other thing that I wanna do for the moment is turn this checkbox, apply ACES reference gamut compress off. We're gonna go back to this and talk more about what this means in just a moment. But for now, I wanna leave it off. I also wanna set up my input transform and my output transform. We're gonna to need to do some version of this anytime we're using ACES or for that matter, any other color management framework. We need to tell that framework where we're coming from and where we're headed, okay? Now in this case, we actually have more than one type of source. So we're gonna to need to deal with things on an individual basis, but for now we can specify Airy Log C3 as our input because that is indeed the color space of shot number two here. And I'm gonna specify Rec 709 as my output because that is the monitor that I'm doing my mastering on, okay? So we've now got our ACES 1.3 color management framework set up here in our project settings. And I'm gonna hit save and we're gonna see the magic of color management at work. We've got a normalized image. We've got an image that looks correct for our display, right? It may not represent our creative intent. It may not feel particularly artful, but it is normalized for our display in a way that it was not a moment ago when it looked very flat and loggish and low saturation, right? But if you notice, the first thing that pops up to me almost as soon as I look at this transformation is you can zoom in right here and look at this detail on this uh, sort of light beam here and notice this artifacting. And if I right click on this thumbnail and I go and I say that I want to bypass my color management, I can observe that's actually not present in the original camera negative. That's not an artifact from the sensor or the capture. That's an artifact from what I'm doing with my ACES color management. That is a great example of something that really plagued ACES all the way up until ACES 1.3. And we're gonna look at the fix that was implemented in ACES 1.3 for issues like this in just a moment but this is a great example of the kind of issue that would often pop up in ACES as a result of the following. It's a result of the fact that some cameras, namely professional cinema cameras, such as Aries or Reds, actually have a larger capture color space than the working color space that is specced out by the ACES standard. So you end up with a mismatch and you can end up with a color that is perfectly valid inside of the camera color space, such as that of uh, this little detail here that falls outside of the color gamut of the working space specified by ACES. When that happens, you get this clipping or artifacting or sort of undesired visual result. And we would in the past have to come up with some sort of hand spun solution to deal with things on a kind of individual basis. There's a better solution now that we're gonna look at in just a moment. Let's go over here to shot number two for the moment and just look at another example of that same kind of thing. So before I dive into this artifact up here, this shot is actually already correctly input mapped because we specified Airy Log C3 as our input space in our project settings. This shot is indeed Airy Log C3. So I'm all good with my pipeline. What I'm not so good with is this artifact up here in the upper left. We're getting this sort of tearing or artifacting in this bright cyan area. Another great example of a color that is perfectly well within the camera gamut when I bypass my management, it looks nice and smooth, 
but when I turn that color management on, it is outside of the working gamut specified by ACES and thus creating this artifacting or this tearing or this undesired result. Lastly, let's go over here to shot number three. Shot number three, I got big problems. Shot number three is all kinds of wrong, right? What am I gonna do about this? What's going on? Well, what's going on is I need to specify a different input color space than I did for shot number two. And before I uh, talk about this input transform, I'll just point out in shot number one, that's actually a shot from a red camera. However, I didn't need to change my input transform in that case because that's an R3D file, meaning Resolve is going to automatically say, oh, you're a raw file. I can unpack you directly into my working color space for whatever framework has been spe specified in the project settings. Cool. I'm going to do that. So in the case of raw files, such as R3D, we do not need to change our input color space. And indeed, we cannot change our input color space. That's all going to happen for us automatically when you are color managing at the project settings level. Okay. Now, in this case, this shot, we have a different story. This is not an R3D or an Airy RAW or some kind of RAW format. This is, I believe, an EXR file. Yeah, you can see down here, it's an EXR file. So I need to treat this a little bit differently and tell ACES, tell Resolve, that I am getting an ACES linear input here. This is not Airy Log C4, the way shot number two is and the way we specified in our project settings. This is ACES linear. So that should be very easy, right? I can right click on my thumbnail for shot number three, go to my ACES input transform and find the setting for ACES, right? Maybe it's here under our color space conversion. But as I start to poke around, I realize I actually cannot for the life of me find an input space for ACES. This is one of the biggest changes, even though it's just a UI change in ACES 1.3 that really kind of perplexed me for a little bit when I first started using ACES 1.3. What do I do when I have an ACES linear source? This is a very common format to exchange and receive files in, especially with visual effects vendors and with other types of workflows as well. So you gotta have a way to get ACES linear material into your pipeline, at least I do in my workflows. Where that's hiding is here under no input transform. So when I want to specify ACES linear, where before I would specify ACES linear as my input, I now simply need to say no input transform. So as I said, that's actually one of the bigger changes to me, even though the net result, once you get it right, is the same input transform that you had before by selecting ACES. It's such a big shift that uh, kind of perplexed me for so long that I want to call it out here. That's one of the bigger changes of ACES 1.3. So we're now properly mapped, as we can see in our image here. However, we're once again getting some tearing, aren't we? Same thing. Now, you also may be starting to notice that generally you're going to see the issues with chroma or color clipping popping up in this sort of like upper right hand quadrant of the vector scope. It's often going to be in our magentas and our blues. And in fact, it may go anywhere here on this whole right half of the vector scope because you will often see it in cyanish colors as well. So that's generally where you're going to see these things and we've seen three examples that sort of range in severity and it can be a real issue in aces when you see it certainly but what's even worse is when you don't spot such an issue right away and you might be in your second pass or in my case you might be sitting in the room with clients and for the first time notice oh wow there's some bad clipping or tearing going on in some little corner of my image that i need to find a you know sort of hand spun tailored solution to deal with that that's not ideal, right? So with all of this drum roll, let's talk about what was introduced in ACES 1.3 to solve this on an automatic basis as opposed to on a shot by shot incidental basis. I'm gonna go back to my project settings and you may have guessed what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go back to this reference gamut compress checkbox that I turned off and take a look at what happens to, uh, in this case, the artifacting or tearing on the uh, ride over here when I hit save. Look at that, all that detail, all that contour, all that color that was present in the camera negative has now been restored and we're no longer getting that breaking or that tearing, right? And if we go back over here to shot number two, same thing, that nasty artifact that we were looking at up here just a moment ago has been tamed, it has been dealt with. We've got a reasonable reproduction of that high saturation, high luminance area of the image. And same thing here on shot number one, this light tube that was clipping and artifacting before is now looking nice and smooth. So I started this conversation today by saying that ACES 1.3 to me is really bigger than a simple point release. And the reason is that 
I ended up in my professional practice moving off of ACEs almost entirely just because of the uncertainty of having something pop up that would create such a sort of gamut clipping issue like we saw today in these clips. And either I would notice it and not have time to deal with it, or worse yet, I wouldn't notice it right away and end up embarrassing myself or delivering something that had a technical flaw to it. That risk became untenable for me in my professional practice, so I really put ACEs aside. So for me, ACEs 1.3, even though it's just a couple cosmetic changes and a fix for that gamut compression issue, it allows me to use ACEs with confidence again, and I would encourage you guys in the same way. If you've been sidelining ACEs for the same reasons that I have, it might be a good time to start reconsidering that, especially, as I talked about at the beginning of this video, with ACEs 2.0 around the corner. There's a bunch of exciting changes coming about in ACEs 2.0 that I think are really gonna have a positive impact on our workflow, on our color management, on our pipeline. We're gonna talk about that at a lot more length in this week's episode of Grade School, my YouTube live session that we do on Friday mornings at 10 a.m. Pacific. So if you have questions about ACES 2.0, about what we talked about here today with the gamut compressor introduced in ACES 1.3, or any other question about ACES that you wanna discuss, make sure you join us on Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific for that live session. It's an opportunity to ask whatever questions you have and get them answered live, and to go much deeper on ACES and on the topics that we are exploring than we can uh, in a couple minutes here in one of these videos. In the meanwhile, I hope this gives you some interesting food for thought, some stuff to go play around with, and some stuff to level up your workflow if you are choosing to use ACES or curious about using ACES for the first time.